Hey guys, my name is Johnny Christmas. Uh, it's nice that a lot of you showed up a lot more. <laughs> yeah, a lot more people showed up than I actually thought was going to originally. Um, it's nice that they scheduled uh, all the rants to kind of close up the evening because this really is just a Microsoft, uh, anti Microsoft rant. Let me give you a little intro to what's going on here. Um, this has been something I've been working on like every other day since maybe I got out of hope, and it's so hard to put together. Uh, an anti-Microsoft uh, presentation that one only lasts like an hour <laughs> and uh, two covers um, something that people haven't heard over and over again 50,000 times about Microsoft stuff. Uh, one of the problems I found that I was constantly running into is that you find all these people go, oh Microsoft sucks, fuck Microsoft, but then you go, well why does Microsoft suck? And they can't really give you any decent reason other than well Windows sucks or you know Linux is better um, so I really actually had to go and start doing some research and I looked up a whole lot of numbers and decided to finally stick with um, Microsoft's uh, anti-consumer technology that they build into uh, most of the products that they sell at least in the retail level because if it's not in a retail level it's not consumer geared anyway uh, and so that's what we're going to be talking about a lot today um, pretty much the main things I'm going to try and focus on uh, and limit the presentation to, and I do say I'm limiting the presentation again, I know you're going to have 50,000 questions about everything Microsoft does. Um, I guess more try and keep those to yourself because I really want to stick to what I just had built into this 45 or so minute presentation. Um, one of the main problems uh, that has been plaguing Microsoft since the Windows 95 period uh, and I believe Windows 3.1, though uh, I was pretty much a kid at that time, and I only have sketchy memories of what came in the box when you pulled it out. Um, Microsoft's uh, serial box end user license agreement, um, which I'll tell you why later, why I actually call it a serial box end user license agreement. It's kind of funny, you'll know what I'm talking about. Uh, shrink wrapping, uh, shrink wrap licensing, and uh, how it limits what you can and can't do uh, with the software that you paid a whole hell of a lot of money for. Uh, Microsoft's current um, anti-consumer technology product activation, which, uh, yeah, I know, which not just Microsoft is using, but uh, now Adobe, Symantec, about 10 other manufacturers of software. Um, absolutely. I'm going to get into that totally. Um, and then we're going to finish it up with uh, exercising your rights as a consumer, what you can do to uh, kind of get away with uh, avoiding anti-consumer things like this, and uh, some cactus. Um, let's start off right away with what I was calling the serial box uh, end user license agreement. I'm sure you've all seen this. Uh, this is right off the bottom of the back of uh, a box of, a retail box of Windows XP Home Edition. Uh, and I'm going to try not to do this a lot, but I'm going to read this off the slide, and there's a lot here, but just about every word in here is important to what I'm getting at. Uh, what this here says, and this is printed on the outside of the box. You can see it through the box. You know, when you buy it in the retail store, it comes in that big-ass, um, I guess, harder-to-steal plastic shell that you have to buy, like, a knife from Ron Popeil to open up. Um, what it says in the back of it is, this product uses technological measures for copy protection. You will not be able to use this product if you do not fully comply with the product activation procedures. Product activation procedures and Microsoft's privacy statements will be described during the launch of the product. Sounds all right. They're not telling you what it is here, but you'll find out what it is soon enough. Uh, for installation and use on one computer, see license agreement for license terms. Where's that license agreement? Uh, again, you're going to see that when you launch the installer. You must accept the enclosed license agreement before you can use this product. If you do not accept the terms of the license agreement, you should promptly return the product for a refund. Now, I know uh, I'm at a hacker convention, but I'm sure at least two, maybe three of you have uh, purchased a piece of software from a retail store or have at least visited a retail store that does have software for sale. What's the return policy and software like in there? You, you, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right. You can, if you come in there, what happens when you come in there with a box of software that you pulled the shrink wrap open? sliced open the, the tape C on the top and open up the CD that's inside. W what do they say to you when you go, uh, I don't agree with uh, the license of this product, I'd like my money back? They're going to tell you to screw up. 
And that's that's exactly my point. Now, if you remember what I said, is this this is all what's printed here on the back of the retail box. And what it says uh, several times is you're going to have to open this product up. You're going to have to take the CD out of the case. You're going to have to put this CD into your computer and start running the Windows installer before we are even going to tell you what the license agreement is. And that means that you have to pretty much purchase this product, and if you don't agree with whatever it is they've stuck in this license agreement, you're fucked because you're not going to be able to take this back to the store. The most you're going to get is a refund. Uh, unless you do stand there and bitch and moan for a half hour, as we all know with retail. If you complain enough, you, you will get your money back. But that's a really shifty cereal box way of doing things. I say cereal box because you got to open the box up and dig through it before you can get the prize that's inside. Which is, which is usually trash. <laughs> um, this I'm going to go through it's about four pages of the Windows XP Home and user license agreement. I'm not going to read the entire thing to you. You're welcome. Um, I have highlighted a few key phrases in here which I found interesting uh, and or outright humorous or just plain did not make sense at all. Uh, I'm not a lawyer. I have no legal training. I'm coming at this from uh, the outlook of a consumer. I'm a consumer. We're all consumers here. Most of us don't have any legal training. This is the end user license agreement. This is the agreement they hand to us, the end users. We shouldn't be expected to have any legal training. We're just end users. We just we just put the disc in the machine, uh, and they did. There's not too much legal mumbo in there, but uh, I'm going to go through this anyway. Um, a few things I'm going to mention in here. Did someone had a question. They said, "Okay, <laughs> thanks, Jay." Uh, a few things I'm going to mention in here. I'm actually going to cover. Uh, in detail later, so if it doesn't quite make sense while I'm bringing it up now, you will see. Trust me. Um, one of the first things off the top, in bold face, you agree to be bound by the terms of this end user license agreement uh, by installing, copying, or otherwise using the software. Um, other than installing uh, or copying a piece of software, what else are you going to do with that disk? Anybody? Uh, yeah, Frisbee, toaster, I can't think of anything useful either. I'm not sure why that phrase is in there. It seemed kind of weird to me. Um, right down here, grant of license. Microsoft grants you the following rights, provided you comply with all terms and conditions of this end user license agreement. Now, that seems like a pretty standard way to say it, start off a EULA. Uh, but in this situation, everything that follows uh, that statement is not uh, a right provided to you. Uh, it's a restriction. Microsoft is giving you no rights. Uh, they're giving you just restrictions on what you can do. Uh, and so one thing I have to wonder is, well, they're not actually granting any rights. Does that render this entire thing that follows null and void? Probably not in a court of law, but it's kind of something humorous to think about. Um, following on down, the software may not be used by more than one processor at any one time on any single workstation computer. That's interesting because this is the EULA for Microsoft Windows XP Home Edition. If you, uh, I apologize for not having a graphic for this. But if you look on the side of the box, uh, it clearly states on the uh, certificate of authenticity on that side that this is for a one to two processor computer. Um, I'm a computer technician. Uh, I'm not a huge software developer. Maybe someone out here is. Does anybody know of any way of making uh, a multi-threaded operating system force it to only use one processor if you put it in a dual processor system? Yeah, I, no. <laughs> I don't know either. Uh, so right off the bat, you, you have no choice but to violate the end-user li license agreement right there if you put this on a dual processor machine, even though the outside of the box says it's, it's for running on a dual processor machine. Uh, under that, the license rights granted under the end-user license agreement are limited to the first 30 days uh, after you first install software unless you supply information required to activate your license copy uh, in the manner described. I'm going to talk about that later. I'm going to move past that. Um, the five connection, this is, this is interesting. Uh, a lot of you know that the Windows XP Home Edition, one of the differences between Home and Pro was that uh, you can only have a maximum uh, of five clients connecting to this. Uh, to use resources. Um, and here it says the five connection maximum includes any indirect connections made through uh, multiplexing or other, other software or hardware which pools or aggregates connection. 
Um, I can think of a few pieces of hardware that I actively have hooked up at home and that I'm sure just about everyone in this room does that uh, pulls or aggregates connection uh, and, and causes this, this multiplexing, they put in quotes. Um, one thing I'm thinking of is uh, routers, switches, cable modems, and subsequently the Internet. Uh, according to the end user license agreement, we're not allowed to connect a computer with Microsoft Windows XP Home installed on it onto the Internet. That's a uh, very interesting thing to put in there. Uh, skipping on down further, um, I'm going to get into this later uh, as far as multiple copies are concerned. Uh, you may also store or install uh, a copy of the software on a storage device. Um, I'm going to have to read this off my laptop because it's a pretty low resolution screen. Uh, you may also store or install a copy of the software on a storage device, such as a network server. Uh, used only to install or run the software on or other workstation computers or over an internal network. That seems like a pretty standard thing to say, uh, but I'm going to get into the concept of creating, mul creating and using multiple copies of Windows uh, later on. Uh, page two, just a couple of things here. Uh, the end user license agreement does not grant you any rights to use uh, the WMFSDK, which is the Windows Media Format Software Developer Kit, which is pretty much used uh, to create um, Windows media, audio and video streaming content. Uh, does not give you the right to use any of those components contained in the software to develop a software application that uses Windows media technology. What that means is, for whatever reason, uh, Microsoft has packaged a software development kit with Windows XP Home. However, they are not giving you the right to use it in any way, shape, or form uh, because the only reason you use a software development kit is to develop software such as applications, like they said. Uh, which is a, another thing pointing at uh, exactly how bloated Windows is. Uh, why are they packaging crap into their software that uh, is not actively used by the operating system itself and can now not actively be used by the end user? Uh, lower, moving on down. Uh, Microsoft reserves all rights not expressly granted uh, to you in the end user license agreement. Um, and I don't see any rights, again, I see no rights granted by this end-user license agreement. These are all restrictions granted by this end-user license agreement. Um, and so, as there are no rights uh, expressly granted in the end-user license agreement, does that mean that Microsoft is granting no rights? And it says it there, it's reserving all rights not expressly granted. Uh, right there it says that absolutely nobody on the face of the earth is allowed to use Windows XP Home. Um, a little farther on down. Uh, there's a little phrase here that I'm going to touch on later. Again, it's one of those things we'll get to. Um, this software is licensed, not sold. Keep that in mind. Uh, that's a very interesting phrase when I bring it into another context. Page three. Uh, I'm going to try and skip through most of this. Um, some of this software is labeled as academic edition, uh, and they say here to, to use software identified as academic edition. Uh, you have to be a qualified education user. Um, you go, okay, well, uh, I'm being educated or I'm an educator, or does either of those situations uh, make me qualified to use this discounted software? Well, how do I find out? For qualification-related questions, please contact uh, the Microsoft Sales Information Center, and then they give you a snail mail address. So now, if I'm not sure if I'm, I can legally use a piece of software that I'd like to buy, uh, I have to fire off a, a, a letter to Microsoft. Um, how often do you think Microsoft is going to re reply to your letters? How often do you think Microsoft checks that mailbox? Probably not that often. Um, and then, I thought this was even better, uh, or the Microsoft sub subsidiary serving your country, uh, and they list absolutely no means of figuring out who the hell that subs subsidiary is. Uh, I'm going to skip over that one because we're going to talk about it later. Um, here's a funny one. Any supplements, any supplements or updates to the software, including without limitation, uh, any if any service packs or hot fixes provided to you after the expiration date of the 90-day limited warranty period, are not covered by any warranty or conditioning, uh, warranty or condition, express, implied, or statutory. That pretty much means that uh, any service packs uh, or hot fixes that Microsoft releases to the public to uh, fix things that are wrong with Windows, um, they pretty much don't guarantee that it's going to fix anything at all. 
um, and they don't guarantee that it's not going to screw your computer up worse than it was to begin with. It's fantastic. Um, as far as retribution goes, except for any refund elected by Microsoft, you are not entitled to any damages, including, but not limited to, consequential damages. The software does not meet uh, Microsoft's limited warranty. Uh, and that pretty much says if their software doesn't work uh, the way it's supposed to, tough. Try and take it back. It ain't going to happen. Um, and down lower in that same vein, pretty much all of this here just says this over and over and over again in uh, maybe 200 different types of wording. Um, and down here, uh, in some weird instance they think may be possible, uh, that Microsoft would offer a remedy to the situation that you may be having. To exercise your remedy, contact Microsoft and, again, uh, give you this address to uh, write to. Um, down here, what is this one here? Um, this, is, this is probably one of the best parts in the end user license agreement, and I'm going to duck down and read it here. Uh, Microsoft and its suppliers provide the software and support services, uh, if any support services. They put if any in parentheses. It's pretty funny. Uh, as is and with all faults. <laughs> Did they just openly admit that there's m multiple faults in the operating system? Uh, as is and with all faults, and hereby disclaim all other warranties and conditions, whether express, implied, or statutory, uh, including but not limited to any if any, parenthetical again, uh, implied warranties, uh, duties or conditions of merchantability, of fitness for a particular purpose, uh, meaning any claims they made that it's good for your particular situation, they don't actually stand behind, uh, of reliability or availability, uh, of accuracy, of completeness or responses, of results, of workmanlike effort, and this goes on and on, of lack of viruses, uh, and of lack of negligence, <laughs> all, all with regard to the software and the provision of or failure to provide support or other services, information, software, related content, uh, blah, 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 uh, otherwise arising to the use of the software. Uh, and, then, and then it goes into boldface to really nail this home so you can't say that it was all lowercase and I couldn't read it clearly, I guess. Uh, also, there is no warranty or condition of title this doesn't even make sense. Uh, our condition of title, quiet enjoyment, quiet possession, correspondence to description or non-infringement with regard to the software. That last part does not make sense to me. It seems like just a mass of words strung together in bold type with a period at the end. Um, what's quiet and how do you quietly enjoy Windows? Um, rarely do I enjoy Windows loud or quiet. I, <laughs> I don't know what that is. Uh, quiet possession. Uh, like if I keep it in a safe and don't tell no one, I don't I don't know what any of that means. But basically, this whole this whole run-on sentence of we're not responsible for any damn thing ever that we've done since our inception um, is pretty much what it says. It pretty much says that anything we ever said Windows would do, written, not written, applied, not implied, advertised in a magazine, uh, if it doesn't do that, tough. Uh, try and take it back. It's not going to happen. They're pretty much, this is their bailout statement. This is the cover our ass in case something doesn't work the way we said it should. Um, you're not entitled to a refund by Microsoft. You're not entitled to uh, any sort of remedy, which is funny because all of this here talks about uh, if you have a problem with the software, what Microsoft will and will not do for you. And then all the way here in the bottom it says, if you have a problem with the software, we won't do shit. Exactly. What the gentleman is saying is that uh, when they mention the phrase statutory down there, uh, what statutory means as far as the legal term is, um, if the law guarantees you a right in this particular situation, uh, Microsoft still is not legally required to honor that. So even anything that, that you're, you're guaranteed by law to, be, to have the right to, Microsoft says, well, not from us. And uh, this is 
this is just something that didn't make sense to me at all. Uh, this entire yellow box down here, it's the end of the end user license agreement. Um, it's in a different language. I, I swear to God. Um, from what I can tell, it looks to be French. Um, I, I don't speak French. I didn't bother to translate it because I didn't think it really applied that much to the situation. It was more the humor of the fact that it's in French. And I'm thinking, well, is it a French, views, French version of the end user license agreement? It's only this big. Uh, the other one is, is French. Does anybody speak French here? Is French this efficient of a language? Could you say three pages worth in this? No? I, I took a guess and said no, so I didn't bother translating it. Um, I wonder if there's something hidden in here that, you know, if Microsoft can take our souls. And because uh, I don't speak French, then is it, it I don't know. Right, this gentleman is saying that the French is probably there because this also applies to uh, Canadian sales and software. He's absolutely right. Uh, this end user license agreement does apply to all of North America, which includes Canada, um, but the concept still remains. What is this? Oh, okay. it's, it's the, it's the uh, we don't care. If you don't like it, you can stick it. Translate it into French just to make sure every every person they care about knows that they actually don't care about any person, and you can stick it. I, I am not. <laughs> okay, I, I am not going to turn this presentation into uh, French bashing. I know. And as I said before, it's hard, it's hard to cram a Microsoft bash into an hour long, um, let alone adding in the French on top of it. <laughs> oh, no, they don't have guns in Canada. We're okay. <laughs> Do you have telephones there yet? Okay. Moving along, <laughs> um, back back to the concept of uh, having to open up the cereal box to get the crappy prize inside. Um, one thing a lot of manufacturers uh, are doing, and Microsoft is kind of sort of doing this, but to a more severe extent, uh, is what's called shrink wrap licensing, uh, which is pretty much self-explanatory. Um, just about anything you buy that has a license on it uh, usually has shrink wrap around it, and on that shrink wrap they give you this big sticker with with black text on it, and they stick it on there, uh, usually in a manner um, that you have to, in some way, damage the label uh, in order to get at the goodies that are inside. Um, a lot of software companies do this. They usually stick it on that white CD holder thing that the, that's inside the big-ass, unnecessarily large box. Uh, and so you have to uh, rip off the tag, and it, says, it usually says on it, uh, by damaging uh, this tag, you hereby agree to the end user license agreement, and the, and the tag is usually a size that really limits them printing a four-page end user license agreement on it. So again, it's the cereal box concept where you have to agree to the end user license agreement that's behind this tag um, before you break the tag to get at the end user license agreement that's behind the tag. Um, it's forced acceptance is what it is. Um, what I always wondered is, is one thing I do regularly is when I get those things, it's much easier to take out my pocket knife slit open the top of the thing and take the CD out, and I don't damage the label at all. The label at all. Um, does that give me full reign to do whatever I want with that CD I just removed? Because I didn't damage that label at all. And uh, I'm... What's that? I think I've circumvented the uh, that whole DMCA. Yeah, I... <laughs> There's nothing that says I can't use a pocket knife in conjunction with this software. We're not getting into that. <laughs> okay. Um, so, yeah, it's pretty much what a shrink wrap uh, license is. Uh, one of the concepts that, that comes up, actually comes up regularly uh, in the courts is, is this enforceable by law since you're forcing the user to accept something that, they, that you're giving them no knowledge of? 
Um, and the pretty, the first legal, the the most predominant legal precedent right now, and I'm not going to give you who the judge was or what it wrote or when he wrote this. This is the most predominant and current uh, phrase is shrink wrap licenses are, in fact, forcible by law uh, unless they are unconscionable. And unconscionable is kind of a goofy word. I had never seen it before, so I went and looked it up. Uh, unconscionable means, and I found two definitions. One of them is just funny how it applies to the situation. The first one means uh, exceeding the limits of any reasonable claim or expectation and, and, and the second one was uh, lacking a conscience uh, or a conscienceless villain. Uh, kind of funny how I stuck that in a Microsoft uh, rant. Um, one, one thing uh, Microsoft tried to do to get away from calling their end user license agreement that they stick with Windows, Office, uh, and various other pieces of software they sell is saying, well, it's not a shrink wrap license. Um, because they put this this little tag in here it says this software uh, is licensed not sold and so they say well we're not actually selling the software uh, so there's no license on the shrink wrap because there is no shrink wrap because there is no software that's being sold so whatever the hell you just walked out of uh, fries with that cost you three hundred dollars doesn't actually exist and good luck taking that back <laughs> I, if and in, if in fact, if in fact uh, the that you're not you're not buying a license, uh, that you're not buying anything uh, at Fry's, can you just take it? I I, I guess <laughs> you're you're well. That's the other thing is if you're buying the license through a third party, they bought it from from Microsoft. Somebody somebody paid for that license. Somebody was sold this software. And then they sold it to you. Um, if nobody was ever sold this software and it just magically appeared from fairies on the shelves of, of electronic stores, um, I say we can all just, just go in and grab it, and it's cool, and just walk on out. I'm Is that like the Schrodinger's cat theory? <laughs> where, where at? Where everything is licensed up until the point where you open the box, and then it may or may not be once you get inside. <laughs> it's it's a real oh I see it it is an actual. I'm not getting into that either. <laughs> Trying to keep this short, and you're not letting me. <laughs> I knew this was going to be a problem. I totally knew I'm going to have this big room full of Linux users. They're going to go. I know all about this. Oh man. <laughs> Um, some other stuff that uses shrink wrap license. I guess I don't really have to get into it. You know what? Um, software titles. Uh, computers and laptops, uh, mainly laptops, pretty much when you pull them out of that box, they're still wrapped in this plastic like it needs any more packaging. Um, cause I guess if you're going to kill the environment, go all the way. Um, if it's got that shrink wrap license on the outside that says a bunch of stuff that you don't read, and I didn't read, so I don't know what it says. Um, again, I usually just take my pocket knife to it. Um, and one thing I found was interesting is a lot of televisions uh, come with with uh, shrink wrap licenses attached to them or uh, stuck on a warranty form that's inside of the box. Uh, and even though they don't have shrink wrap, it's still a type of shrink wrap license. Um, and I thought it was funny because if you use this phrase that uh, this this television is licensed and not sold, I what. What's taking up all the room in my back seat? Is it yeah? <laughs> can I can I then go ahead and charge Magnavox for storing their crap in my back seat and subsequently in the entertainment center in my living room? Um, is the usage of the TV the payment they make for storage? That's a really roundabout way of giving me a TV. Oh, that's correct. Yeah, what they're saying is uh, that if when they're saying the software is licensed, not sold, it means that now that I have the software, 
I don't currently own it still, so I can't go ahead and resell it to somebody else. Um, what's kind of funny about that is isn't that what all retail stores do? That they buy this software and then they immediately resell it to somebody else? Maybe it doesn't apply because they're not actually opening the software and using it and then still selling it. I don't know. Like I said, I'm not too big on the legal stuff. This is just something, as an end user, I was looking through the end user license agreement that I've been forced to agree to uh, to see exactly what it was I agreed to uh, so many years ago. Um, and as far as, as all of this really goes, um, as far as shrink wrap licenses, actually the whole concept being brought to court um, and, w and any major um, legal precedent, there really is none. No manufacturer, no major corporation has brought a single end user of a single device to court uh, and held a trial against them for um, not abiding by whatever their shrink wrap license is, uh, mainly because, um, and I thought Acidus was going to be in here because he's got first-hand experience with this, um, the corporation's not... was. The corporation is most likely not going to come after you um, unless you are doing something that directly threatens a part of their technology or their business or their income or something like that. Uh, mainly because, A, they don't, if, if you're not doing anything that really harms them in any way, um, they're not going to spend the time and the money to sick their lawyers after you. Uh, and even if they did, um, they would attempt to get some amount of money out of you. And, and as far as a corporation like Microsoft goes, um, I think that everything that's in our combined bank accounts is nominal to Microsoft. Then keep, keep that under wraps. <laughs> they might hear you. They got satellites watching us, you know. All right. Um, I'm going to go uh, a little bit into copyright law uh, and maybe even a little bit into uh, when it is and is not okay to make copies and distribute copies of software that you've bought. Uh, and it is it is going to get blurry, uh, and it, I am at some point going to outright uh, say that it's okay to do it, even though legally it's not. But you'll see all that as it passes. You, you didn't hear that from me. Um, in regards to copyright law, um, one of the biggest things they use in, in courtrooms is this precedent here uh, when, it, when a question of uh, is his copyright law being violated. Um, Court Justice Potter Stewart wrote uh, in regards to what the copyright law is and what its real purpose is. Uh, creative work is to be encouraged and rewarded, but private motivation must ultimately serve the cause of promoting broad public availability of literature, music, and other arts. Um, in this particular case, other arts being software development, which anyone who's a software developer knows is in fact an art. Uh, the immediate effect of our copyright law <coughs> is to secure a fair return for an author's uh, creative labor. Uh, in this case, the author, Microsoft, or its employees. Uh, but the ultimate aim is, by this incentive, to stimulate artistic creative for the general public good. Um, so what he's saying there is uh, copyright law is there to make sure that anyone who makes something uh, is getting a, f a, a fair return of the money back. Um, a fair return yeah, of their money back on anything they may have spent on it, and then some extra incentive for saying, hey, that's great, thanks for making this, here you go. Uh, it, is, it is not, copyright law is not in place to fuck the consumer and make him buy uh, a, an additional copy of Windows XP Home for every single computer he has in his house. Um, as of July 2003, and I'm not going to bring up all the charts and the graphs and stuff because you just, you got to believe me. Uh, as of July 2003, uh, Microsoft had all of these zeros uh, in their bank account as like spendable cash. It's $49 billion uh, in cash reserves. Um, does anyone here have anything like that? No? I know you have $10. That's one zero. There's probably a lot of zeros if we add them all up. Um, Forty-nine billion dollars is is a hell of a lot of money. If 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 you guys if you made some piece of software, if you aesthetics, if you made an operating system, if you made an awesome operating system, far better than Windows, which is, yeah right. If if you made 
if you made BOS, BIOS, and uh, someone wrote you a check for $49 billion, would you say, thank you, I'm out? I'd accept that, right? Would you then say, go ahead and do whatever the hell you want with this? $49 billion is plenty? I'd take it. Um, and what I'm saying here is, is if we go by this this fair return concept that the whole purpose of copyright law is to make sure that whoever made the software is getting is is getting a fair return on uh, all the time that was put into it um, I think Microsoft has made far more than that and that's that's their cash reserves that's not what they made off it that's that's their spending money they currently have um, and 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 this 49 billion dollars you have to take in, into consideration that Microsoft is, is just not Windows and it's not just Office Microsoft has all these different separate subsidiaries um, like Xbox, uh, MSN, Microsoft Business Services, all of which are losing money. Nothing, no other part of Microsoft makes money uh, except for um, Windows and Office and any other piece of software like that that it sells to consumers and businesses. Uh, and and taking into consideration that 70% of Microsoft is a failing business and they still have $49 billion to drop on whatever they want, um, I'd, I'd say they're probably making a fair return on their investment here. That's, I mean, it's just opinion, but I'm, I think some of you agree with me there. Cactus? Wiki? Um, I'm going to get into uh, piracy now that we're, we're talking about copyright law and uh, when it is and is not okay to uh, be, be cloning all of your CDs and installing on them on whatever the hell you want. Um, talk about uh, what what the piracy rates in the entire world are overall. When I'm talking about this, you're going to have to keep in mind that I'm not going to be talking about just Microsoft because I couldn't find enough information on just Microsoft because uh, it appears they like to keep that under wraps, and you're going to find out why. I'm going to talk about global software piracy. Um, global software revenue loss due to piracy. Um, a little a little thing that actually gave me the inspiration to do this rant because it 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 pissed me off. The 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 discount that Microsoft gives to known software pirates, and it's 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 absolutely unbelievable. You'll see what I'm talking about. Uh, and then we're going to go into uh, currently used anti-piracy measures, um, easy ways to circumvent them, because anti-piracy measures just make software harder for the legitimate user to use. Piracy rates, in a nutshell, I'm going to try and go through this quick. I know you guys have been here a little longer than I expected. Um, the U.S., the piracy rates in the U.S., uh, um, This is, this is a global study. Um, I can get you the website later. I apologize for not including it in here. Um, I, I wonder that myself. You're absolutely right. He's asking uh, what methods are used to, de to, de sermon, to determine uh, how much software is pirated. Um, yeah, that is a very legitimate question because if it's pirated, how the hell do you know? <laughs> It's not like pirates are going, yeah, that's me, one. I got five here. Nobody knows. Um, but there was uh, a third-party company who does studies that did a study into piracy, and has done has been doing the same study since uh, 1995, and I was able to get all sorts of neat charts and graphs and information from them, and you'll see uh, one of those graphs later that I believe does have the website on it for them. Um, the the piracy rate in uh, the U.S., and this is this is a percentage of... Uh, software licenses, not a uh, dollar value. The piracy w rate for s amount of software licenses in the United States that are currently being used uh, illegally is 22 percent. 22 percent is a nice chunk, uh, but as far as all the countries in the world go, we're the absolute lowest. We have the absolute lowest percentage of pirated software currently in use out of every single computer currently existence on Earth. Uh, and everyone else, of course, accumulates uh, accounts for the other 78 percent. Um, and if, if you look at, and this is this is the numbers that Microsoft uses to justify the the 
insanely high priced uh, prices on all of their software uh, is that in the U.S., $7.2 billion uh, is, is lost, lost due to piracy, and I guess they take that, uh, the estimation of the amount of licenses used in this 22%, add Microsoft's um, retail, I guess, cost uh, to that amount of license, you get $7.2 billion. And if you take into consideration uh, all the countries that are also pirating, we have the third highest uh, loss due to piracy. Um, and two things you got to keep taking into consideration when looking at the number, you go, oh, well, maybe Microsoft's right if we're the third highest in the dollar loss. Um, a lot of those people who are pirating the software, uh, if they were not able to pirate that software, would they have gone down to Best Buy and picked up a copy of XP Pro? Probably not. I think a lot of those people would, would probably rather learn Linux than drop $300 uh, on an operating system. So that's kind of a bad thing to say because you're saying, well, we lost $7.2 billion because all of these people aren't uh, paying for the licenses, but it's a lot of people who would not have paid for the license in the first place anyway. What? Hang on. I'm getting into that. You're absolutely right, 100%. Um, and I'm actually getting into a chunk of that next. He's saying that there's, there's different versions of Windows that are shipping in different areas uh, of the world. And some of them, um, believe it or not, some versions of Windows out there are absolute shit. Um, <laughs> hang on. I, settle down. I know. I know. It's blasphemy. <laughs> Man. Um, and, and one of the things to consider there is for those crappy versions of Windows that are out there, Microsoft is asking for less money. Uh, and with the, the conversion rate of the dollar to everything else in the world being absolutely crappy, um, <laughs> um, we have a bigger, we spend more money on software in this country than any other country. And, and thus, uh, if you're multiplying the amount we spend on a, on a software license by, the, by that 22%, you're going to get a much higher number than if you count, like, Southeast Asia, which spends far less than we do and thus is going to have a lower dollar amount. But they use, Microsoft likes to use a dollar amount to go, we've lost, we've lost so much money due to piracy, so we've got to charge you $949 for a copy of Office XP Premium. It just doesn't make sense to me. And $7.2 billion when you've got $49 billion in the bank um is that really something to cry about do you really have to take any huge measures like jacking up your prices to uh accommodate that um i i really don't think so <laughs> there is there's is the rumor that bill gates is attempting to just save up enough money to buy redmond washington uh and then just cut it out and float it off into the ocean I good good riddance, I say. For that, I would donate a thousand dollars. That's three more zeros you can add add into there. <laughs> Little island floating in the in the Pacific is a lot easier to hit. <laughs> oh man, jeez! All right. Put put the pitchforks down. Um, this is this is one of the fun little graphs that I found from uh, a company called Cutrail Cutrail, which does do uh, third party studies such as this. Um, though their I, their means weren't exactly clear, so I guess we're going to have to take this uh, with a little grain of salt. Um, but what what we're showing here is this and this is global software piracy, not just Microsoft, but of course Microsoft is one of the major software distributors in the world. So this does very much apply to them. Um, and this is what I found here is the difference between software piracy uh, in 1999 uh, in the blue and then uh, piracy in 2001. Uh, and this is uh, the amount of licenses of software that are currently being used in an illegal manner. Uh, and we're, we're right, where are we? I mean, we're right here. Um, and so if you look at uh, 1999, about 30, we were about 30% of uh, 
software is being illegally used in this country. Uh, Eastern Europe, Middle East, and Africa. I don't think mo any software is really used in the Middle East and Africa. It's pretty shady over there. Um, but some is. And so there's a low piracy rate because uh, maybe the study couldn't really track in there in the first place. I bet that's one of the reasons. Uh, and then one thing you've got to pay attention to, and, and you see this huge spike, is uh, Asia and the Pacific. Um, and specifically Southeast Asia actually is one of the huge problems. Uh, is that while uh, every everybody uh, between 1999 and 2001, uh, the piracy rates have dropped some significant amount. Um, I mean, we dropped to uh, a little bit below 20% at that point uh, from right around 30%. Huge drop as far as things go because you're low in the percentages anyway. And if you take a look at Asia, that just jumps up there. Between 1999 and 2001, you're, you're hitting almost a 50% piracy rate. That means almost... Almost half of all the software currently being used in Asia is illegal. Half. Half. And, of course, that's where, all, where you know, obviously a significant amount of the piracy is happening. And Microsoft is using the fact that half of all their crap is being stolen in Asia and telling Americans, oh, well, you know what, uh, you're pirating our software, so we're going to jack our prices up some more. Because uh, I know XP Pro costs a hell of a lot more than, than 2000 Pro did. Uh, and so they're using the entire world's piracy problem to punish us. Because we have the money to spend because we're America and we're all, you know, even though uh, half the people in this room are freaking broke, we're still freaking rich. <coughs> and the, the graph on the bottom is kind of a little better representation of here. It kinda, it's, it's a graph between the two. Uh, and you can see every single co country has dropped. One of the significant things here is the piracy in the U.S. and Canada uh, has dropped far more than any other area of the earth. So our piracy has fallen way off. We have, we have repaired our problems significantly more than any other area of the earth, Well, as Asia and the Pacific is the only one uh, that's gone up, and they have gone up a whole hell of a lot. And again, we are being punished for it because we are rich Americans. One, and this is this is this is what I was talking about. This is the thing that pissed me off. Uh, Microsoft is releasing a new version of the XP operating system. It's called Windows XP Starter Edition. Uh, it it will not be sold in this country. Uh, it sells for the equivalent of thirty six U S dollars. What does Windows XP Home cost here? I really don't know. One ninety nine in the stores. Um, that's $200. They're selling the starter edition for $36. So, well, we're, we're going to look at the features. I'm thinking eh, it's probably not as good. Um, can it get worse? I, it's, it's, apparently it got you know $150 worse. Um, but, but here are the countries that this starter edition is being offered in. <coughs> Indonesia, which has an 88 An 88% piracy rate. Eight, 90%. And this is this is specifically Microsoft products here. This is not this is not software in general. This is this is Microsoft products. 90% of all Microsoft products in use in Indonesia are being stolen. We should. <laughs> we should. We should bomb them and, 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 and set them straight. That's, that's terrorism in a nutshell right there. It's, thank God Bush is on top of this. <laughs> Indo Indonesia does not have oil. <laughs> no. Indonesia has a massive amount of oil. All the more reason. But going down the list, Russia, right up there, 90%. 90, 90%. You know what? All of these guys have oil. <laughs> and apparently Microsoft is trying to make the world safe for democracy by giving them $36 operating systems. Maybe Bill Gates is just saving up to buy all their oil. Um, you go down, I mean, look at this. This is insane. 80% of all Microsoft products being stolen and used. And what are they doing? Well, we're going to give them a discount. We're gonna, you know what? Um, maybe it's just too expensive for you. How's thirty-six dollars instead of two hundred? Is that okay? Yeah, I know. So, uh, and then of course down here, 
Um, I have to explain this. It is not being sold in the United States of America. I put this down here to point out again that uh, we have a 22% uh, Microsoft software piracy rate. Only 22% of our Microsoft software is known to be pirated, uh, and we are giving no uh, Windows XP Starter Edition for no $36 because we're rich Americans. Um, and so, like I was talking about, well, it's the Starter Edition. What does that Starter Edition mean? Is it like uh, you get like an 800 by 600 resolution and uh, no start button or something? <laughs> It does not ship with uh, explorer.exe. Well, let's well we're, let's let's take a look at what's in it. Um, here's here's what uh, Microsoft lists on their website briefly as the features. I'm not going to read all these. Uh, it comes with internet connectivity, so you can in fact connect to the internet. I was thinking maybe well you could just use it to run your computer. No real internet access or anything. No, it's right there. In fact, all these descriptions are the exact copied and pasted from the descriptions of Windows XP Home, too, I noticed. Um, software and hardware compatibility. Uh, Microsoft states that all software and hardware currently compatible with Windows XP Home Edition is, in fact, currently compatible with Windows XP Starter Edition, so there's no hardware limitations there. Um, Windows user interface. It's, it's, it's actually a slightly different user interface, but I'll get into that later. Uh, it's better. Um, security, exact same security at... I'm sorry. I tried to hold a straight face. I tried. Let's. Uh, I probably should have just scratched that off. I. Oh, I, I left it there because it is the same level of security as Windows XP Home. Um, I can say that factually. Um, communication. When I don't know why they keep pushing this Windows Messenger bullshit, but they do. I don't. Whatever. Uh, digital photography. It's, again, it's a hardware software compatibility thing. Digital music and video with Windows Media Player 9 series, which does all your, your music and video formats as long as you plug a codec into it. Um, where's the problem? Where, where is the limit? Why is this only $36? What, what, what bowels did they gut out of this to, to, to say, well, we're going to tone it down? Well, they didn't. In fact, they added more to it. It's pretty much Windows XP Home Edition, uh, and then they've they've individualized it for every country that they're going to be selling selling the software in uh, by adding in. Um, this is kind of dumb, but custom wallpapers that feature major landmarks of those countries. Uh, I'm pointing it out because they put they put extra work into this. They went and took and got pictures of those landmarks and included them in there. <coughs> they probably you know downloaded them off fast track. Um, and and all of these the starter the reason they're calling it the starter edition is because um, it's coming with this this massive amount of like tutorial and educational videos that you know help you get into the Windows environment in case you never used it before uh, and all these videos and tutorials are in are in all of the languages that are currently spoken in all of these countries um, in America because we're rich we have to go buy that from the video professor uh, off late night TV. Uh, but Microsoft is putting all of this extra effort in this starter edition and uh, charging every uh, high piracy country on earth a neat little 36 uh, US dollars. Um, <clears throat> and so let's see what Microsoft has also been doing to try and prevent uh, piracy from going on, at least in this country, I guess. Um, a lot of you guys who work with OEM, uh, you know, pre built machines, Compaq, HP, Sony, and the like. Um, we're familiar for uh, pretty much since the inception of Windows XP. It kind of started around there, and it's actually starting to uh, taper off now. But for a long time, uh, these computers were coming with what were called restore partitions, and you would have to hit a key when the computer started up or launch an executable from within the operating system uh, in order to uh, re-image the system if the need be. They were not shipping with operating system disks. Um, which was kind of funny because originally, uh, after from Windows 98 Second Edition on, uh, you, the computers were shipping with CDs, which could only be activated uh, when a certain piece of code existed within uh, the BIOS ROM, uh, and that seemed like a great piece of uh, anti-piracy measure because you, even if you copied those CDs, you couldn't give them to anyone else to use unless they had the same motherboard and the same BIOS revision on there, and most of the motherboards used in these OEM systems are like are like proprietary. 
OEM boards, which you really probably wouldn't want to build a system around anyway because they're all shitty. Um, and so it seemed like kind of a weird thing to do. The only thing I could think of doing that for is to save money on the production of CDs um, because, you know, as we talked about before, Microsoft is freaking broke, and so they got to cut corners anywhere they can. Um, they were using product keys for the longest time, pretty much from Windows 95 on. Um, and for the longest time, it was easy. You know, if you lost your key or if you needed to get your hands on a key for whatever reason, uh, you just pop into the registry, take a look at it, grab it, pull it out. It's right there. Uh, they stopped doing that with Windows XP. They may have stopped doing that with Windows 2000. I didn't check. Does anybody know? Is the Windows 2000 key readily available in the registry? Great. Um, so as far as I know, they did it in Windows XP. And even then, all you got to do is just, you know, Google up key XP or any other sort of, you know, 25K executable, which just decrypts the hash and gives you the key anyway. Um, one of the big things that Microsoft started maybe four years ago that you don't hear much from these days uh, was pretty much they were like the RIAA of uh, Microsoft. Even though they claimed to be working for all software companies and alliance, they were called the Business Software Alliance. <coughs> And their job was to um, get information about companies who may be using uh, pirated software and give them an opportunity to cop to it and say, hey, you know what, just buy these licenses. You'll be totally legit. You'll be legal. Um, you will not be bothered about this. It sounds, sounds like an acceptable um, thing to do. It sounds it's a really good idea to stop piracy. Uh, I read a lot of uh, reports and reviews and interviews and things on people who uh, had to interface with this business software alliance. Uh, and basically they said it's a bunch of bullies. They call you up and they threaten and they... Yes? Well, exactly. He's saying that uh, he, he sent a, a few emails to the BSA, and I don't want to get too deep into this BSA, uh, but asking that uh, it, for people who report, uh, a lot of people do report that companies are using unlicensed software as disgruntled ex-employees. Absolutely 100% true. He's asking uh, if do those disgruntled employees get uh, a cut of the money uh, related to all of the uh, licenses that the, so the business ends up buying. Uh, my guess is no. Um, he never got a response. Um, one of the things I notice is that uh, what th what this BSA does is when they say, well, you have X amount of unlicensed pieces of software in your systems, uh, here's how much it's going to cost. That cost for those licenses is, ins is inflated anywhere from 33 to 107%. 107% markup on a license for a piece of software is, is unacceptable. But they call up these companies and they threaten them and they they pose legal they threaten legal action against them. They get them all scared and they go, "Give us all your money," and they come and point the guns. And then the business has to go, "Oh my God, here's all my money," uh, when in fact that they had just gone out and bought the licenses on their own uh, in the same manner they would have saved a whole lot of money. Um, and that's pretty much what the what the BSA does is they oh and the main thing is that they they don't work off of any sort of proof. They work on tips from usually from disgruntled ex employees. They don't look into it. They don't do software audits. They just call you up, and they go, "Well, uh, you've got X amount of dollars in unlicensed software running in your company. Uh, pay us now, or Microsoft's going to pose legal legal action against you." They, if you ever ask them to say, "Well, how, how do you know that?" Um, they'll just start threatening more legal action against you until you either pay them. Uh, or you force them to actually send someone down to your business uh, for uh, an audit of all your computers, and probably by that time you've fixed the problem and they're not going to find anything. But um, in this country, it's all about just scaring the crap out of people until uh, they just do whatever it is you want them to do. Fear to action, they call it. Um, and then the th what they're using now, and uh, not, like I said, not just Microsoft, but a lot of software companies are using now, is product activation, um, which is easily bypassed. 
And I'm talking about easily bypassing Microsoft's product activation, not because I'm saying, well, you should just go uh, on BitTorrent, download Windows XP Pro, uh, and install it on all your computers and bypass the product activation this way. I'm saying it because going back to the copyright law we were talking about, um, I feel personally that Microsoft has uh, obtained more than a huge return on any work they put into making Windows. Uh, and if I, as a consumer, um, wanted to go out and buy Windows XP Pro for $300, $300 is a lot to me uh, as, you know, a 25-year-old in America working, you know, an IT job. Um, if I got to drop that much money in the operating system, I'd like to be able to install it on, uh, you know, two or three of my computers in my house. Um, and, I, and I don't think that's an unreasonable thing to ask. Yeah, according to Microsoft and according to the law, it's not legal. But, you know, as far as, as morality is concerned, I don't think that it's a moral thing to impose on the average consumer. Um, most of you who have dealt with Windows, I'm sure, have already gone through this. Or, you know, you probably wouldn't be at a hacker con. Um, one thing I found that was interesting is Microsoft only retains uh, product activation. Maybe I should go into what product activation is. Or does everybody know what it is? Yeah, no? I'm going to let it know. Yeah, okay. All right. Um, yeah, okay. It's, this is pretty much the last slide. Um, and it, Microsoft's product activation, pretty much when you connect up to the servers, you give them hardware ID, you give them the, it sends them the product key, uh, and that's it. Um, Microsoft, because they're so, sh so short on funds, they can't possibly afford to keep buying hard drives to keep holding the more and the more activation keys that come through there. So what they do is once uh, a data file reaches 120 days of age, it's deleted off the system. So uh, if you do have two systems, you want to put it on like your desktop at home and then your laptop that you're going to be taking with you, which I think would even be legally okay because you're not using the operating system at home if you have it on your laptop and you're on a plane somewhere. Um, if you want to do that and you can wait, uh, you know, 120 days to reactivate, go ahead, just put it on there, reactivate it like you normally would, um, and nobody will be the wiser. I, there's, there's plenty of ways around it. This is, this is hardly a full list. Um, if, if, in fact, you can't wait that long, uh, and one of the other things it tells you is, well, uh, you gotta, you got to call up Microsoft if there's a problem because we're not going to let you activate this. Go ahead and call them up. Uh, one of the things that says on the little box that pops up, one of the things that it says while you're on hold with Microsoft is no personal information will be required from you. Um, and if they st once you get an operator on the phone, if they start asking you things like, have you installed this software on another computer, just be a bitch. Start repeating exactly what, what their, their message said to you. No personal information is required. I feel that's personal information. What I'm doing in my house with my computers, um, it says that all I need is a hardware ID, and a product key. That's all that will be required of me. You can sit there on the phone and just repeat your hardware ID and your product key over and over until they activate you. You don't have to tell them anything. No personal information is required. It says that several times. Um, I have heard reports of operators hanging up on people who do this. Um, so one thing you may want to do is get the operator's name and like a badge number as soon as they pick up. And then if they hang up on you, call back. Ask for a supervisor and go, so-and-so hung up on me. All I was trying to do is activate my windows. They'll let, you, <laughs> they'll let you do it. Start crying. <laughs> start, start saying, you know what, and there's, this is this bureau of missing people with like 500,000 people answering phones, and it's not even Microsoft. It's a company that Microsoft outsourced to answer phones. Just start saying they started swearing at you and called you all sorts of mean names, and all you want to do is activate. They'll let you. Um, and as far as you're going, well, now no, I'm sending information to Microsoft, and and I'm calling them, and, and, and they're gonna, if, if I install this on my machines, they're going to come find me. One, you're not really doing anything to pro that deprives Microsoft's technology or income to any significant extent. Can they come after you if they wanted? Yes, absolutely. Will they? Probably not. Um, the, if, if, in fact, all your computer is sending them is a hardware ID and product key, then then they have no information to go by as to exactly who you are, um, especially if you just installed Windows. You probably have absolutely nothing on that system that's personally identifiable whatsoever except for maybe your IP address. Uh, and as we've seen from all the, the uh, RAA cases that, I, that are said to have a, a, attempted to exist, um, anytime the RAA tries to subpoena uh, addresses based on IP addresses, like physical addresses from IP addresses from ISPs, the ISPs are totally noncompliant. 
They don't want anything to do with any of that. And the law says the ISP does not have to comply. And as the ISP wants as little legal, as legal, legal problems as possible, they're probably not going to help Microsoft in any way. Uh, and like I said, there's no sense in Microsoft even trying to find you anyway. Uh, and so it's my bit on uh, Microsoft's anti-consumer technologies. Uh, thank you all for staying. This turned out to be a really big uh, event. Stay tuned for Odysseus's rant. Um, he's actually a pretty good speaker. He's one of my favorites, and he's up next. See you all tomorrow.